Penzias and Wilson's error, in my mind, is that the paper should not have gone to an astronomy journal. It should have been published in a regular general physics journal so that people can think about it. But what happened with the Penzias and Wilson measurement is that it was immediately adopted by the astronomers. We measured the temperature of the entire universe. Now, at the time, their antenna was sitting just a few kilometers away from the Atlantic Ocean, right? They were in New Jersey, they were very close to the sea. And nobody gave any thought to how does water behave in the microwave? And that was a serious problem for them, and it's still a serious problem for the astronomers. They just do not understand water. Because of that, I think they've let themselves be fooled. They, they claim, well, look, we've measured the microwave background several ways. So, not now, Penzias and Wilson were only at one frequency, but eventually the COBE satellite gave us the curve. And to get such a curve, I'm saying you need a lattice. I'm also requiring that lattice within water. People know the hydrogen bonding network in water. That hydrogen bonding network assumes a hexagonal planar lattice. So that is a very, very dangerous thing for the astronomers. The problem is they, they want it to work out and they have their own journals and they send it to their friends to review and it doesn't go to imaging experts at large that would tell them, well, wait, you don't have signal to noise and you don't have image stability and you don't have a unique map. And then the big problem is you cannot see through the galaxy. Anybody who understands water suppression in NMR and nuclear magnetic resonance can see that this doesn't make sense. They cannot do it because they can't subtract it out properly. They don't know what it is. What is this value? So this is a real problem for them. So today is a very exciting day because we kind of get to the meat of the conversation. This is our fourth conversation and over the course of our previous talks, we've gone over the history of MRI and the building of the 8T machine at Ohio State, which Dr. Robitaille played a key role in. We also talked about what his experience taught him about the nature of thermal emission and how his understanding of the laws of physics fundamentally changed his interpretation of Kirchhoff's law of thermal emission. Then we talked about the way that changes to his interpretation of Kirchhoff's law affected his understanding of the structure of the sun, which lies at the heart of cosmology, astrophysics, really at a lot of the stories that humans tell themselves and each other about the nature of the cosmos. So today we're going to head into the good stuff, the Big Bang, cosmic microwave background radiation, the paradigm that needs to be shifted at the center of physics. So, so before we start, though, I wanted to, because since we're doing a podcast, my wife tells me people are always interested in the background. So mm. I, I wanted to tell people what the background was. Sure, so, yeah. So the little lighthouse there that you see at the back, I've had in my bedroom when I was a child, when I was a newborn. So I, it's 61 years old now. It was always with me. And then the little boat that's there, I, I asked my grandfather for that little boat when I was about five years old, it was sitting, back in those days, TV sets were furniture, and it was sitting on top of his television set, and I asked my grandfather if I could have it, and he gave it to me, so I've had that 56 no. years now. So those are those two items, they're some of the oldest things that I own, and that's why they're in the background. So for those who wanted to know what the background was, now you know. <laughs> And, Do you uh, see yourself as a sailor on the boat sometimes? I do have a sailboat, and I do, oh, and I do sail. Uh, and I have never sailed a large boat. I, I just have a Flying Scott, which is a 19-footer. It's just a day sailor, and I've enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I haven't sailed yet this summer, though, but hopefully I'll get to it. And, uh, yeah, so, so last time we talked about uh, the gaseous sun and how we got into the, the gaseous sun. How, how did solar physicists adopt the idea that the sun was a gaseous plasma? And we talked about the fact that they viewed it as an ideal gas. But I wanted to go back because in the 20s, in 1920s, in the 1920s, there was actually a, a controversy as to, is the sun a liquid or a gas? So genes held that 
James Jeans, which is, uh, he was a secretary of the Royal Society. He's, he's, he's known, uh, uh, extremely well-known physicist, even in black body radiation, for those who know about the ultraviolet catastrophe. So anyhow, so James Jeans held that the sun was a, was a liquid. And he, he was a constant adversary of, of Eddington. I mean, they, these guys had pretty, uh, pretty intense rivalries. And, and Jeans, he, he saw the sun as a liquid, and he, he, he argued that, you know, there's a lot of binary stars out there, and the, and the reason that they're binaries is because you, you have this mass, and it's rotating, and then it divides. And so he, he saw the stars as, as liquids. But the problem Like is, droplets. Pardon? I like droplets. And actually, it's interesting for people who, who follow uh, astrophysics, you know, Chandra Shekhar, who won the Nobel Prize in, in astronomy, uh, mostly for his, his models of the sun. I mean, Chandra Shekhar spent years of his life studying rotating liquid masses. Now, in addition to doing the gaseous models, he, 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 wrote, he wrote a textbook on rotating liquid masses. Well, that's not because he cared about raindrops. It's because he, he understood that maybe the, the stars are condensed matter, and that's why he, he, he also ventured into that area. But Jeans, Jeans was the last real advocate of liquid stars uh, of, of the 1900s. You know, the, he, but the problem is he didn't have a building block. He couldn't make a liquid star. He thought... He's, he thought that the sun was was radium and and got its energy from radium decay and and you know when the sun was shown to be hydrogen well he was left without a building block but if he would have if he would have recognized that that just wait a little bit in 1935 so this was in the 20s in 1935 Wigner and Huntington came out with their important paper on metallic hydrogen and if he would have put that together, he would have gotten his building block for liquid stars. So I, hmm. for whatever reason, that never happened. So James Jeans ended up a, abandoning the idea that the sun was a liquid because he didn't have a building block. He, he didn't see how he could make one. And then Eddington, of course, he was the champion of gaseous stars. And uh, he was also one of the first proponents that stars are driven by nuclear reactions in their cores. And... And he, he came up with a relationship for a temperature of the star where the temperature that he got in this relationship, it's, it's just temperature is equal to the, uh, the gravitational constant times the mass of the sun times the, the, the mass of the, the fundamental particle, which in this case was the proton, divided by five Boltzmann's constant times the radius of the star. And what happens in this relationship is you end up getting a temperature which is non-intensive. And that's a violation of thermodynamics. Now, in the 20s, when, when Gene... And can you clarify what you mean by non-intensive here? So yeah, Steve went over this a little bit, but I think Steve, we should review Steve it. Steve might have, might have talked about it a little bit in his podcast. And this is a quite important concept in thermodynamics, that the temperature is always uh, an intensive property. That means that you can measure it at any point, and it doesn't depend on how much mass you have. But, you know, if you take a brick and it has a certain temperature and divide the brick hypothetically in two, the two halves don't end up changing their temperature because you divided them, right? So They might lose heat quicker, but at that instant, they would at, have the at, same temperature. So hypothetically, if I, if I divide the object in two, you know, the temperature doesn't change, right? So, so Not for a minute. So isn't is isn't there temperature that gets transferred to whatever's dividing it into? Like if you have a knife, I think it's like a magical knife. It's a magical, it's a magical knife. knife in this case. Mm, we're gonna mm. we're gonna divide the mass and if you so mass is is known as an extensive property, right? It's additive. So if you if you have more mass, it, mass grows additively, and it's a, in mathematics we say it's a homogeneous function of degree one, but temperature is a homogeneous function of degree zero. And this is quite important in, in thermodynamics because, you know, the, the, the zeroth law is defining the temperature. And, and it says, you know, if you have three objects, A, B, and C, and A and B are in equilibrium, and, and B and C are in equilibrium, then A and C are in equilibrium. That's the, that's the zeroth law of thermodynamics. But, but in, in that law is also 
you know, it's, it's an understanding that temperature is intensive. You can actually go anywhere in those objects and measure those temperatures. And if they're in equilibrium, then, you know, A and C will be, if A and B are in equilibrium and B and C are in equilibrium, then A and C are in equilibrium. And that, that involves the concept that temperature is intensive. You can measure it at, at any location. It's and an Eddington must property. have believed that temperature could perform this way because he thought that the bodies could do work on themselves through gravitation, right? The astronomers think that, that the stars are doing work on themselves through gravitational collapse. We talked about this last time where, you know, they, 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 they have a big enough cloud of gas and they, and they think it gravitationally collapses and it has a, what's called a negative heat capacity. I mentioned it last time. And, and, the, and, you know, gases don't have negative heat capacities. And, and when they saw this in their mathematics, that should have warned them that, well, something is not right here. And then, then Eddington went on after he, he, during this time period, he, he wrote a book, The Internet, Internal Constitution of the Stars. And that, I think that was released in 26, 1926. And in that book, he, he came up with a mathematical uh, expression for the math for the mass luminosity relationship so if you look at the stars you know they, they sit on the main sequence you have the main sequence of the stars and the in the HR diagram and then the, it was observationally recognized that the stars have a relationship between their how luminous they are and how massive they are on the mat on the main sequence so a bigger star has more luminosity is brighter and and Eddington came up with a formula for the mass luminosity relationship and that's how gases how stars became gases he used the ideal gas law he in, he invoked the idea, the idea that stars are gases and then he got this relationship and then he said well now you know we we can see that yeah the stars have to be ideal gases and it, it was nonsense i mean the the james jeans his proponent said that it was just mathematical trickery. There was nothing to the math, mass luminosity relationship. Now, later on, Steve and I, Steve Crothers, who you had on a previous episode, and I, we, we wrote this paper together on, the, on uh, Eddington's uh, mass luminosity relationship and, and, and its relation to the laws of thermodynamics. And, and the problem is for... What's it called? It's so called people can find Eddington's it. mass luminosity relation and the laws of thermodynamics. And the, in this paper, we demonstrate that Eddington's luminosity, now luminosity, according to Stefan's law, luminosity is just equal to, so you have L is equal, that's, that's luminosity, is just equal to a constant, the area of the sphere times the fourth power of the temperature. That's, that's the, the relationship of luminosity to temperature and, and this fourth power dependence, which is, comes from, which is, Steph, is a statement of Stefan's law. And luminosity in that expression is a homogeneous function of two-thirds. That's kind of interesting. It's a homogeneous function of two-thirds. But, but Eddington, in his derivation of the mass-luminosity relationship, he ends up getting, and mass is, is a homogeneous function of degree one, he ends up getting a luminosity which results in a temperature which is no longer intensive. It's no longer a homogeneous function of degree zero. So, so people who look at this from a thermodynamic point of view, they'll see that there's something wrong here. This, this cannot be right because genes, I mean, Eddington changes the, uh, the, the nature of luminosity itself instead of being a homogeneous function of two thirds, he changes it and it, it, it no longer makes any sense. So, so, now, so this is this is a theoretically derived relationship. This right. isn't empirically he, Eddington, measured. Eddington, well, it's observationally seen. There's a mass luminosity relationship that's observationally uh, demonstrated. But, but the temperature is inferred, and the temperature is inferred in it. And and Eddington, what he what he does is he 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 gets a relationship, and he's able to fit the mass luminosity relationship of the stars using. Uh, a ma mathematics which came from the ideal gas law and it looks all very good but the problem is it's got violations of thermodynamics in it it can never be correct and so he, he wrote he said we must conclude 
that either we have been misled altogether by the theory of the mass-luminosity relation, or that dense stars like the sun, the material behaves like a perfect gas. So either he's been misled or they're perfect gases. Well, what did the astronomers adopt? They, they adopted that the stars were gases. And, and this was the... This but was your, point, your point is that rather than assuming that the stars were gases, they should have assumed that they were misled by mass luminosity? Yeah, they were misled by, by, by Eddington's derivation. The reason that stars have a mass luminosity relation on the main sequence is because the stars in the main sequence have the same lattice type, okay? They, 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 they all should share the lattice of the sun. If they're on the main sequence, they share that lattice. And if they go off the main sequence, like a white dwarf, I'm saying a white dwarf is off the main sequence, not because it's smaller, but because it has a different lattice, just like you'll have less luminosity there. And so that's why the luminosity in a white dwarf is less. But for Eddington and the astronomers, the way they get the luminosity to be less is they, they have only one thing they can control is the radius of the star. So in order to get less luminosity, right, because L is equal to the, is directly proportional to the area. So what they do is the surface area of the star, they just compress it. They, they bring the radius down so that they can get less luminosity because they know the temperature and they can't control that. So, so their only thing they can play with is, is the radius of the star. And, the, and so when they see something like a white dwarf that doesn't have much luminosity, they say, well, it's got to be very, very small. And then they say, well, we, and we know this is true because we have, we have red shifts. The, our red shifts from the, from the dwarfs are telling us that it's very massive. But of course, there are, red, there, there are dwarfs that also have blue shifts. And what they do for those, <laughs> they just ignore the blue shifts. They say, well, those comes from an accretion region outside the, sun, outside the star. And it, it doesn't have, actually, it's not a gravitational redshift. And, and so they, they play gymnastics. Let me ask you this. Would you be able to imagine a mass luminosity relationship that didn't depend on temperature? Or do you think well, that... Well, no, you, you leave temperature in it, but, but what happens is that it's the, it's the lattice of the, of the star that is, that is, because all these stars have the same lattice, right? As you make them bigger, they all have the same emissive material on the outside. So the bigger you make it, the more emissivity, the more emission you're going to get, more, the more luminous they're going to be. And that's a function of the lattice of the star. And, and probably this is the thing that Jeans realized. Remember, he was, he was thinking liquid stars, and, and he said that, you know, that there, there's no validity to the mass luminosity relationship. Of course, I mean, he inferred that, that they were, because stars have different mass luminosities, and it depends on different star types. And what I'm saying is, if, if you have, luminosity is controlled by two things. It's controlled by temperature, that's one thing the apparent temperature of the star. And then the other thing that controls it is what is the lattice that the star has? So this, this is quite an important uh, misstep by Eddington, which the solar physicists followed. And I see. So you, you, you don't have a problem with this relationship. You think that I it, it does... I, I see. I you think it problem. does model the phenomena well, but the interpretation is crazy. But... Oh. So the mass luminosity relationship exists ex em empirically. We can measure it. it. That part exists, but the gas using gas laws to 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 arrive at that description at that relationship, like Eddington did, is just a mathematical trick, and it it's a it's a violation of the laws of thermodynamics. You end up with non-intensive temperatures, and so yeah. that that should have been a warning sign, and the astronomers just never paid attention to it. Now, the, the other thing is, when you look at the stars, when you look at the sun, you know, the astronomers tell us there's no surface on the sun. It's an optical illusion, right? And this goes back to the days of Hervé Fay in 1864. He was the first one that said, well, it's only, a, the, the surface of the sun is just apparent. It's, it's not really real. There's no real surface there. And the astronomers, because they have a gas model, they can't put a surface on the sun. I mean, where do you put a surface in a gas? So they have a real problem there. So they define the surface mathematically through something called optical depth. We don't need to get into that. But, but what I'm saying is, no, there's, it's not an optical illusion. We have a real surface on the sun. And that's How do you define surface, by the way? This is something we've been talking about a lot with our audience lately. 
How do you define a surface? Well, I mean, a, a surface involves a, a phase change between one, one phase and another, right? So you, just, you look at a lake, it, it, has a, it has a certain phase, and above it, there's another phase. It's gas so it's phase like a structural a thing. So, so, so the surface has things that characterize it, like surface tension, right? In a liquid, mm. you have surface tension. And, for instance, in the sun, you have, you, have, you, have, uh, you have granules in the sun, right? And, and what happens in these granules is you have, you have a process called Baynard convection. So if you look at the sun in the high resolution, you'll see the granules and you'll see convection these convection cells. And they have, a, they have a process within it called Baynard convection. Well, Baynard convection is a surface-driven process, right? So if you see, you can see that when you, uh, if you take an oil, for instance, put it in a pan on a stove, you can generate Baynard convection cells, okay? And, and the astronomers actually use Baynard convection to, to think of the granules. They think about it in terms of Baynard convection. But you can only have, Baynard convection is a surface-driven process. So if you have Baynard convection in the sun, on the, in the granules, then you, you have to have a surface. So there's a, there, that's one of the 40 proofs that the sun is condensed matter. But, you know, so, so the astronomers tell us it's a gas, but they never tell you why it's a gas, other than the fact that it's hot. Well, it's hot, so therefore it's a gas. Well, it doesn't work that way. Phase diagrams don't have just temperature in it. Right? They have temperature and pressure and what is the material and it, all these things come into play. So if you look at the sun, there's actually ample evidence that it's condensed matter. And, and so if you take, I think I mentioned this before, if you take an astronomy course, they tell you, well, you know, the sun is a gas and then they start with the, the equations of state for gases. Well, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, you tell me what the phase is. What's your evidence that it's a gas? And I provide evidence that no, it's condensed matter. And, and the sun has a true surface and it behaves as a true surface. So they're optical illusions. So they tell us it's an optical illusion. But the problem is their optical illusion is behaving like a surface too. It's not just an optical illusion. And it doesn't just occur, you know, the evidence for a solar surface doesn't occur just in the optical range, right? It's over all the electromagnetic spectrum, right? The sun rings like a bell. And we know this, we, we do, they do helioseismology in the sun. So, so waves travel within the sun, and then when they get to the surface, they bounce back, they bounce back interiorly. So they're feeling a boundary there. And, and, and so it's, it's resonant, mm, it's boundary. acting like a resonance. It has resonance. So, so that's, you, you, know, you can't do helioseismology on a gas. I mean, you can't do seismology on a gas. Seismology is a science of condensed matter. And, and the helioseismologists, well, they say, well, no, no, we, we do this in a gas and we can have all these modes in a gas. And this is just nonsense. The sun uh, has ample evidence that it's condensed matter and people need to start thinking about this. And, and that's why I, I promoted, you know, I started writing this paper, 40 Lines of Evidence for Condensed Matter. And because I wanted people to start thinking about it, you know. Do we just accept what the astronomers tell us? It's an optical illusion coming back from 1864? Or do we say, well, look, our instruments are giving us plenty of evidence that there's condensed matter there. And, and then, then we have the right building material. You know, we, we can have hydrogen in condensed state that, that provides for it. So when, we, when I was young, you know, Jupiter and Saturn, they were called the gaseous planets, right? There was, these were thought to be completely gaseous. But today... We, they know there's metallic, they, they believe there's metallic hydrogen inside these giant planets, right? So they, they, they have condensed matter in them. And the same thing's going to end up happening with the sun. It's just a matter of time that people recognize, okay, the sun has condensed matter. And so that, that's the point I want to make is that, you know, it's, a, it's an important thing for astronomy. And it, it's going to take a long time for, for the astronomers to, to finally come around because they, they have to give up so much. But uh, I think if you look at, you know, if I go and see a lake, I don't need an astronomer to tell me that it has a surface there, right? I mean, it's an observational thing. There, there's ways that it behaves. Like if you throw a pebble on the lake and you, you get ripples on the pond, you, and those are, tr they, they, they're capillary waves. And, and, and the sun also has capillary waves. And the astronomers say, well, well, well we're going to, instead of using a surface to generate the capillary waves, well, then they come up with some concoction, you know, that, 
the, 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 you get a disturbance and it travels in the interior of the sun and then it's reflected on some magical surface and then gives us the capillary waves and comes back to the surface and it, it is just nonsense. You, what is the reflective material? That there? It's a gas. You, do, you don't have a reflective plane to reflect anything. But, but they create it mathematically and then they, they convince themselves that they, they can generate capillary waves inside a gas. It, and, and, and the sun has transverse waves on its surface. I mean, it, transverse waves occur in condensed matter. They don't occur in a gas. I mean, gases can sustain longitudinal waves. So, so, so you know, these are elementary things in physics that are just being misapplied in the sun. So I think it's, that's why I'm appealing to people, as scientists of all kinds, to, to start thinking about this stuff. And, and this, you know, we don't have to buy into, you know, into the land in Florida and swampland. I mean, we, we can start thinking about it and say, hey, guys, I mean, really, the sun is condensed matter. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. So I, it strikes me that the key to how this moves forward in the future is this word plasma. Because if you read about the myriad uses of that word, there's almost a liquid form which has conductive properties and sounds a lot like a liquid metal. And you can kind of imagine how these astronomers might just be like, well, that's what we meant by the word plasma all along. Right. So, so when you look at plasmas, you know, we talked about it briefly before. You I mean, you can have gaseous plasmas. You know, if you fully ionize a gas like hydrogen, you'll get, you'll get the atom, the proton, and then the electron, and, and then you have a gaseous plasma. And then I'm saying the sun is more like a one-component plasma. It's a... It's a liquid plasma, right, where, the, where the, the nuclei are arranged in the lattice and the electrons are flowing in conduction bands. And so, you know, it's not anything that they've ever suggested. Now, you know, and there's a risk here, too, that you don't want... The central thing about the sun being condensed matter is that it has a lattice, you know. You, you can't just invent states that don't have lattice structure because that, if you do that, then you're unable to explain the solar spectrum. So the key proof for condensed matter is the solar spectrum. The other proofs are secondary. Now, now that's, the solar spectrum is the more complicated thing to understand, you know, that, that why is it that we need a lattice to get the solar spectrum? And, and people can start reading and if you're interested, pursue it. And, and you'll see that, you know, it goes back to the graphite argument. You know, you get a thermal spectrum from graphite. What does it have available to it? And, and all it has available to it is the vibration of, it, of its atoms within a lattice structure. And it gives you a black body spectrum. And, the sun and I like to tell people at home, they can just look at an incandescent bulb, right? It's got a lattice versus, say, the fluorescent lights in an office, that don't have a lattice, right? Yeah. Now, lights are, are a little complex because when you enclose a gas, uh, you can get continuous-like properties for that gas. Mm. And, and because now you've rigidly enclosed it, right? You, 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 I see. you have a bulb and you, now you have, you have an enclosure and then you drive energy into it and then now that enclosure is, is restricting the gas. But well, that doesn't happen in the sun. There's no in a gaseous sun. There is no restriction. I mean, it's it's fully gaseous. There's no boundary. It's mathematically defined surface. So and those spectra look completely continuous in a black body sense of no, enclosed not, gases. But 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 some light. So if you look at bulbs, you know you you like the sodium lamp. It'll it'll have a continuous hump, and then it'll have a line. You know, there could be a line in the lamp, and then like a broadened, a, a broadened hump, a, a broadened continuous part, and then gotcha. and then a line, right? So the the bulbs that that mankind makes, I mean, if they're made out of gases, they're always going to have some deviation from being black body, right? So and then there's significant deviations. So so you just have to be aware of that. So anyhow, it's, it. so relative to the sun, I think the the key thing is. You know, if one thing can be achieved in the podcast, I mean, I talked about Kirchhoff's law and the, the recognition that Kirchhoff's law is, is not valid. There's no experimental or theoretical proof of it. And, and that has consequences that you, you can't have a gaseous sun. It's, it's as simple as that. Once Kirchhoff's law collapses, it's, 
it's over. You need condensed matter to get to get that thermal spectrum. So and that also throws the rest of cosmology at least some of the foundational elements into question too, right? Right. So so now you get into the microwave background, you know that that so the astronomers they they think well, the microwave background so the earth, you know, is bathed in a 3 Kelvin background. And this was first measured in 1965 by Penzias and Wilson in New Jersey. And, and you know, it's 3 Kelvin. I mean, the Earth is not a 3 Kelvin. Everybody realizes that. So, obviously, when they got a 3 Kelvin signal, that they, they, they said, well, the source is at 3 Kelvin. So, tell us a little bit about the experiment, though. Like, what, what was the background for this? The Big Bang was already kind of a cool idea. No, they, they were working with, a, they were working with a, uh, an antenna. And then they started measuring the noise on the antenna, and they found that, it, that you know, they, they had a background noise that was coming from around them. And, and if you took that temperature, you got 3 Kelvin. They were only at one frequency, though, okay? So they couldn't fit it with a Planck curve or something like that. But they knew that, okay, well, this, this amount of noise at that frequency, if you have an equivalent source, it would be at 3 Kelvin. So they said, so... So they went ahead and they said, well, the, the source, we found a source at 3 Kelvin degrees and they took a real temperature. They said, the source is at 3 Kelvin. So the question is, were they allowed to do that? You know? And the answer is no. I mean, if, mm. if I would have been a reviewer, I would have said, now, wait a minute. In order for you to assign a real temperature here, if you believe that Kirchhoff's law is right, you have to have an enclosure, thermal equilibrium with the perfectly absorbing enclosure. So are you telling us that your source, whatever you're finding, this source, is, in, is enclosed in thermal equilibrium with an enclosure? So of course the astronomers, they said, well, at the Big Bang, at the very beginning, we had thermal equilibrium. Somehow they create thermal equilibrium <laughs> in a Big Bang scenario. And they, and they said, well, we had thermal equilibrium and, and we could consider it enclosed at some period in time. It was just nonsense. They, they never had enclosure. So, so the problem is, is that once you recognize that Penzias and Wilson took a temperature and they vi if Kirchhoff's law was correct, they were in violation of it. They didn't know that they had enclosure. So they weren't allowed to take the temperature and call it real. They should have only called it apparent. It was an apparent temperature because they couldn't say for sure that this is what it's coming from, right? Now, of course, the well, what's really interesting to me is that they reported this apparent temperature, and I think the article right afterwards explains it in terms no, of this cosmology. Before it, sorry, the ant, explains it's it. It's explained before. I always Cos give them a in hard terms time. of cosmology, though. So yeah. it's like this theory already predated the theory that explained it. Predated the finding, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. So people were looking for this temperature, and and what happened was that when Penzias and Wilson made their discovery, then people said, well, yeah, this is, com this is the coming from the universe, you know? This is the microwave background, and it's, it's the signature of the Big Bang, and, you know, now we measured the temperature of the whole universe sitting here on our little planet, and it's just, it just, it boggles the mind that people well, would, would make such claims. And, do you and have not, any sense of why people wanted to prove the Big Bang so bad? Well, I mean... Cosmology, I mean, in the old days, they used to say, well, if you're a cosmologist, you know, you sit on top of the astronomy building with a case of beer and you think about the formation of the universe. That's what people used to do <laughs> before the 60s, right? And then after that came the microwave background and people thought they had a real measurement that had something to do with the universe, that they have measured the temperature of the whole universe here. And, you know, they should have paused and thought about it. I mean... Do we really understand the environment that this is coming from? Is this a real temperature or is it apparent? And in, in a, and I'm It certain. just seems like you wouldn't necessarily be interested in, in asking those questions if you already believed in your theory before right. going and, into and the, the experiment. Paper, the paper, instead of Penzias and Wilson's error, in my mind, now they made a great discovery, but the error in my mind, if there is one, is that the paper should not have gone to an astronomy journal. It should have been published in a regular general physics journal so that people can think about it. But what happened with the Penzias and Wilson measurement is that it was immediately adopted by the astronomers. We measured the temperature of the entire universe. Now, at the time, their antenna was sitting just a few kilometers away from the Atlantic Ocean, right? They were in New Jersey. They were very close to the sea. 
And nobody gave any thought to how does water behave in the microwave? And that was, that was a serious problem for them, and it's still a serious problem for the astronomers. They just do not understand water. And, and because of that, I think they've let themselves be fooled. So if you, so if you look, you know, they, they claim, well, look, we've measured the microwave background several ways. So around the Earth, you know, we... Be, before you move on past water, I think just to clarify what you're saying, water is pretty wild substance. It, even though it's in the liquid form, it can display lattice-like properties. Right, and, it has uh, a fleeting lattice. And we'll get back to this at the end of the podcast. I want to talk about water in greater detail because it's extremely important for people to see why it is that it's a high probability that the signal came from water. Remember, I'm saying that to get a thermal spectrum, like Penzias, not now Penzias and Wilson were only at one frequency, but eventually the COBE satellite gave us the curve. And to get such a curve, you know, I'm saying you need a lattice. Now, I'm also requiring that lattice within water. Now, in the sun, I'm saying the lattice is hexagonal planar. So the question is, does water have the potential to give us a hexagonal planar lattice? And the answer is yes. And that's, that's the problem for the astronomers. But, and that's been seen empirically with things like AFM and other techniques. People, the hexagonal lattice people of water. Know, people know the hydrogen bonding network in water. And, and that, uh, that hydrogen bonding network assumes a hexagonal planar lattice. So that is a very, very dangerous thing for the astronomers. They should be very aware of it. And if you look at, you know, I wrote a paper uh, in 2009. It was called COBE. The, it was on the COBE satellite, and it was called COBE, a radiological analysis. And in that paper, I described all the problems that every time that they had problems with water when they measured on Earth. They, they constantly had problems with water all the time. There was even a... There was a Japanese rocket just before the Kobe satellite was launched, and they had too much microwave background signal. How do you get too much signal, right? You got a three Kelvin signal, and they had mm. too much signal. Well, that's telling you you've got a contamination coming from somewhere here. There's something wrong. And of course, if water is condensing within the horn of these antennas on these rockets, and you got condensed water, then you're going to get signal from it. And, and so one of the first things people usually point to when you bring this up, I'm sure you've heard this a ton, is, well, yeah, but they measure this signal at L2 or something very far away from right, Earth. Right, right. They try to tell us they've measured the monopole at L2. So, so the curve from Colby, the famous curve, the 3 Kelvin curve, it has never been measured beyond the Earth, okay? So Colby was 900 kilometers above the Earth, that satellite that measured the curve in 1989. It was just right near the Earth, right? 900 kilometers, and you're sitting on the Earth back practically, right? You're in the Earth. You're, you're near the Earth. Now, at L2, you're one and a half million kilometers away, and there are two satellites that went there, WMAP and, and uh, Planck. And neither of those satellites measured the monopole. I mean, they measured anisotropy, which we, we can talk about later. But neither. But they were them, already looking for a curve, you're saying, and they filtered for it, essentially. No, no, they didn't, because those were different. WMAP was a differential instrument. It, it actually compared two horns and always took their differences. So if you have three Kelvin on this side and 3.1 Kelvin on that side, well, the difference is going to be 0.1 Kelvin. So it I always see. took the difference. So the WMAP satellite was completely unable to measure the monopole. Now, they, they could have... And, and can, you, can you clarify that a little bit? I, I'm still a little confused. So they weren't able to measure the black body spectrum or they were? They were not. So at L2, it, you, you will not find a black body spectrum measured at L2. It's, it's never been done. The Why does everybody map? seem to think that they measured the black body spectrum? People say it, yeah, because they don't know the literature. I mean, and I've spent years, I, I know the literature here. They, they, the WMAP was, the, that satellite was unable to do it because it was a differential uh, radiometer. And what did it exactly measure then if it didn't measure the black bound, or, sorry, the it, black it, body It measured spectrum. the anisotropy, so it measured differences in microwave signal between two parts of the sky. Ah, I see. The two, the, the two horns were always taking a difference, okay? It never measured the absolute signal, so that's WMAP. And same, same with Planck. The Planck satellite, 
measures a, a difference between the horn that's pointing at the sky and a reference load, which is supposed to be at 4 Kelvin, and it's taking a difference between those two all the time. So it's also acting, actually that's a pseudo differential radiometer, and, and actually it should have been able to see the monopole, but they never reported it. And, and they always just gave us their difference between what they saw in the sky and the 4K loads that, that they're taking a difference from. So, and the difference that they measured, though, is also congruent with this microwave background temperature? No, no, because what happens is you, you get something. So now let's look at orders of magnitude, right? You have three Kelvin signal around the Earth. Kobe measured it. Rockets measured it. We have lots of measurements. Penzias and Wilson measured it. So we have lots of measurements around the Earth. We have three Kelvin. That's, the, that's called the monopole. And then we also have a dipole signal, which is the first derivative of that monopole. And, and, and so you say, well, okay, at L2, we, we should have measured the dipole. And from the dipole, we, we would know that we have 3 Kelvin at L2. But what happened was that the astronomers used the dipole that they measured on Earth from the COBE satellite. They, 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 they took the FIRAS data, which was from the monopole, and they said, okay, the first derivative of that looks like this. So that means that at L2, the dipole has to look like this. And so they use that to calibrate their instrument. So they use the dipole for calibration. Therefore, they couldn't use it to measure the monopole because they had used it to calibrate their instrument. So that's why the monopole has never been measured at L2. Now, Fixin has a paper, which is... So you're saying they basically baked the answer to their own question into the apparatus? Well, they never... They never, because they use the dipole for calibration. It so sounds like they never even asked the question. They, they, they never were able to ask the question because they relied on this is what the known dipole behavior needs to be as a function of frequency. And then they calibrated their instrument that way. Got it. So because they calibrated using the dipole, they can't use the dipole to get what the monopole value is. Now, actually, Fixin... <laughs> He, he actually wrote a paper saying, you know, saying that, oh, yeah, now I'm going to go back after calibration and I'm going to get the monopole. You can't do that. You've used, you've used the, and that's why he's a lone author on that paper, I think, because people realize you can't do that. You just use it for calibration. You can't go back now and say, well, now this is the adjusted monopole value. So this is just bad science. So, so the monopole, which is what we care about, the three Kelvin signature, has never been measured at L2. So when people say, oh, Robitaille doesn't know what he's talking about, we've got satellites that are a million and a half kilometers away from the Earth that measure the monopole and Robitaille's lost. No, those satellites never measured the monopole. They measured the anisotropies. So, so those are two different problems. And the, the anisotropies... I mean, what are the anisotropies? You know, they, they go out there and they, they see slight variations in microwave in the sky, you know, one part of the sky and the other part of the sky. And they try to give this all very fundamental, big bang, fundamental uh, importance. <laughs> but it has none. I mean, first of all, you know, there's galaxies, there's point sources, galaxies and stars everywhere in the universe. And they're emitting microwaves constantly, and they, those microwaves have nothing to do with the Big Bang, right? The, the galaxy is emitting microwaves right now. And, and so one of the problems with the, with the anisotropy maps, so you see these maps, you know, they, they publish these maps, and they say, well, this is the, the map of the Big Bang, you know, the, the signature of the universe, and it's just nonsense. The, the, the map doesn't even have, there's no such thing as a unique map. So it's all mathematically. So let's look at WMAP as an example so that you can understand what these maps are. So you have these maps and they, they have red, yellow, greens in it. And they looks very impressive, you know, because you have all these points in there. And this is the signature, the residual, the Big Bang. And that's what was measured at L2 by WMAP and Planck. But the problem is, is that how do they generate these maps, right? So the, the way they generate these maps, let's say for WMAP, that, that satellite has five channels. So what they do is they take channel one and they, they get a result from it. So each one of these is giving you a result. And then what they do is they take a linear combination of these that's sum to one. So, you know, so they, they multiply the first one by 0.4 and then, they'll, and then they'll add that to the second channel, which they multiply by minus one. And then they add that to the third channel, which they multiply by plus one. 
And so in the end, after they take their linear combination, they get one. So they, they've summed plus and minus the channels to get one. Well, anybody in the, with a computer can take a linear combination as they like and provided that they get one, they'll have a valid linear combination, right? Who's to say, to say what the coefficients are? So it's just nonsense. There's an infinite number of solutions. You don't have a, you don't have a unique map. And so for, for, for WMAP, there are five channels. And for Planck, uh, there, there is uh, three low-frequency ones. And uh, I think there's six high-frequency channels. And, and so that now they take nine channels and they combine them. To get, so now before we had five And this channels. is all probably in an effort to visualize very complex, nuanced frequency information. Yeah, but, 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 but you're processing nonsense. The, 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 because there's no such thing as a unique map, right? So anybody can combine the channels any way they want. Now the astronomers try to tell us, well, let's weigh it on V band. They, they try to say, well, we're, it needs to be weighed on this band. Well, that's your opinion. I can weigh it on any band I want. Hmm. I mean, and, and I could build satellites at different frequencies and I'm going to get different answers. And so it's just, it's just playing with, with, and it's not, I don't even call it data because if you look at individual channels, they don't even subtract properly. So if I look at, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm looking at 23 megahertz, gigahertz with the Planck satellite, and I collect, I look at the sky at 23 gigahertz for a year. Then the next year, I look at it again. Well, the sky doesn't change if, if you believe that this is coming from the Big Bang, right? It never changed from year one to year two. So when you take the difference between those two, they should perfectly subtract, and they don't. I mean, their, their data does not subtract at all. It's, it's, so they have huge, so they have, so... In NMR, you know, we, we have signal to noise. People say, well, oh, you're an MR person. You can't be criticizing these poor cosmologists. But, but you know, in NMR, I mean, in MRI, you know, you, you take an image and then you have signal to noise. Let's say it's 150 to 1. And then you take another image exactly the same way from the person's head at exactly the same location. I'm just going to redo the exact same image. Well, what do you want? You want that when you take the difference between those two, you get zero. And that's what happens in MR, right? That's how we can tell that the scanners are stable, right? We, if we take one image and we take, again, the same image, they better give you zero, right? Because sure. I'm, if I'm taking the difference between the two. But if you ask so, the cosmologist to take differences in their maps, they don't get, they don't, they don't get zero. Now, the problem is, I have a 150 to 1 image, let's say, an MRI, okay? So if I have a small error and I get a residual, I mean, my, my image is still valid at 150 to 1. If I had 149 to 1, I'm still going to make a diagnosis, but my scanner is a little bit unstable. But for them, their signal to noise is like 1.5 or 2 to 1. Well, that's not signal at all. So what happens when you have a signal to noise of only 1.5 or 2 to 1, like the cosmologists do? And they try to call it real. Well, in medicine, if you have a low signal to noise image, you better make sure that it's stable. It has to subtract. So that way you can call the noise real. You can call mm. the signal real, right? If you have a signal of two to one, and, and now you repeat it, and you get again the signal to two to one, and it's identical. When I take the difference, the, the, you get just noise. The two is gone, okay? And it perfectly subtracts. But, but the astronomers don't have that. They have... They basically are, they have almost no signal to noise, so they have two problems, right? They don't have a unique map, and then the second thing is they don't have reproducible data. Their signal to noise is not high, and it's not reproducible. Now, in, in radiology, let's say you, you have a very weak signal, and, and sometimes you will, like you'll do procedures, and you'll have a very weak signal, you know, two to one, when people do functional imaging and so on, where they, where they assess... Uh, changes in function in the brain as a result of blood flow and activation. Like if you turn on some lights, you can ac activate your occipital lobe and then we can actually, people can map this. And I'm sure most of the audience have heard of functional imaging with MRI. Well, those signals are very weak, but guess what? They subtract. So mm -hmm. we know that they're real. So if a signal is, is going to be real, it better be stable. And if it's not stable, then you don't have real. So, so, there, so there's several problems with the, the microwave background and isotropy maps. The first is there's no unique map. 
The second is they have no signal stability. And the third is they have to look through the galaxy to see the universe, right? We're in the galaxy. They can't take us out of it, right? So what do they do now? They, they need to see on the other side of the galaxy. So they actually think they can subtract out that they have perfect knowledge. They think they have perfect knowledge and they can take out the signal from the galaxy and see what's behind it. Well, that's just absolute nonsense. And I'm, I know I'm being hard with them here, but you know, I mean, it's been 20 years of, or more of telling the world that, that we understand the nature and birth of the universe and the data is so poor and, and the methods are so bad, to me it's not even science. And I, I've, I've said it before, cosmology is not science. And, and well, I, it seems like a classic case of humans looking at a piece of toast and seeing the Virgin Mary. Like yeah, if, if exactly. these people aren't self-aware of their own biases, like they really want this big bang thing to work out for some reason. Right. They really and want so it it's to like, work they're out. almost like they're just, they, it's really, really important, at least on our planet that we declare our own biases when we right. make these proclamations. The problem is they, they want it to work out and they're their own reviewers, right? So, the, the, you know, they, they have their own journals and they send it to their, their friends to review. And it doesn't go to imaging experts at large, you know, that, that would tell them, well, wait, you don't have signal to noise and you don't have image stability. And, uh, you know, you, you, you uh, don't have a unique map. There's no unique map at all. You're just generating one and, and saying, well, that's the map. Well, I can generate one in my kitchen, too, and, and I could get a different map. And mine's as valid as yours is. So there is no unique map. And then the big problem is you cannot see through the galaxy. If you, have, if you have a strong signal, and we see this in MRI, you know, in MRI, we, we have a water peak and we, we get the MRI image using that water peak. But below the water peak, way, way down, <laughs> there's molecules there, right? Under the water peak, there's molecules, right? But we cannot see those molecules because guess what? There's a huge overlapping signal, right? Water is 110 molar in protons, right? So you're not going to see a 5 millimolar signal below it. And, and so, but, but as MR scientists, we actually can get to see that. And how do we see it? Well, we have the ability to control the signal at the source. We can do things to the water and take it out of our spectrum and just leave the residual below it. We can control it at the source, okay? So, and this is the subtractive, uh, subtractive process. Well, there are techniques about. that we can use in MRI where we manipulate the spins and then we can get the spins that we want and throw ones that we don't want. But the astronomers don't get to control the galaxy. They don't get to control the signal at the source. They just have it and they have to deal with it. And the problem is, is that there's, that signal is is extremely high. I mean, it's a thousand times bigger than the, the little residuals that they want. So they got this enormous signal and they think that they can characterize it and then they're gonna get a residual below it that's gonna be real. And it's just, it's just insanity. And, and the problem is, is that they have not been forced by the spectroscopic community or people who do uh, signal processing on large signals in the presence of small signals in the presence of large ones, they would see right away this doesn't work. If it worked, they could come and save us all in medicine. <laughs> they can teach us all how to, how to make, how to see a small signal in the presence of a large overlapping one. It just, it cannot be done. And anybody who understands water suppression in NMR and nuclear magnetic resonance can see that this doesn't make sense. They cannot do it. They cannot see beyond the galaxy. So they, because they can't subtract it out properly, they don't know what it is. What is this value? So this is a real problem for them, you know? Sure. So, I'm, so I know I'm being a little bit tough on the cosmologists today. And, and because, because, you know, they, they bring to mankind this belief that we understand the formation of the universe. I mean, I remember in the 90s, Congress had declared that it was going to be the era of the brain, of the decade of the brain, you know? But we don't understand how our own brain really works, you know? So just because Congress makes a pronouncement that this is going to be the decade of the brain, I mean, we've made a lot of progress, but there's a lot of things. I mean, I don't know why I so much remember the smell of my mother or, you know, of you know, the perfume she wore or whatever, even though she's been dead 20 years, how is this all stored, you know? 
So we don't really understand. And to, to claim that we can understand the birth of the whole universe is just, it's just too much. And, and it's, at, at some point it becomes not science, it becomes mysticism. And, I, and I've been very hard on the cosmologist. And I think it's high time that somebody is, that somebody stands up. I'm sure they've been hard on you too, so I'm sure it's no, fair. It's they, okay. they can handle I mean, it. I don't mind pe people being hard on me. This is a question of science, right? I'm not attacking an individual person. I still see that Penzias and Wilson had a great discovery, right? But, but to claim, to make pronouncements, and this is what happens in astronomy all the time. You, they, they make these wild pronouncements and now we're imaging black holes and when you look at the data, it's just, it's absurd. I mean, I don't understand how the world gets so enthralled of something and I think it's because people that have imaging experience are not going after these guys and saying, hey, you can't do this. This doesn't work in imaging. And, and people try to say, well, he does medical imaging and they do astronomy and it's different. No, it's not. I mean, imaging is imaging. And, you know, when you fill K space or UV space, in the case of the, in, in MRI, we, we call it K space, but it's actually UV space. And this is how we collect an image and how the astronomers collect an image. And there are certain rules about how you're going to fill that space in order to get the image. And the astronomers are breaking it with their with their black hole claims that they've imaged a black hole uh, in M87. I mean... Can you imagine a way for people from other disciplines to criticize one another productively? Like, the, you've the obviously problem. had a, had well, a real... It seems like it needs so much domain expertise in each field of science to be able to criticize it that it's almost impossible to get someone from one discipline to cross over into another because they don't feel qualified. But they don't feel qualified. It takes years to learn this stuff, right? So for me, I was kind of blessed, you know, because I, when I left MRI, you know, I started thinking about this stuff and reading their papers. So I, I've got years of, I had years of image, years of imaging experience beforehand. And then I was able to digest over time what is going on in astronomy coming from the background of somebody who's well-trained in spectroscopy. So, you know, and well-trained in imaging. So th th there's, there's a reason that, you know, they don't get reviewed by outsiders because let's face it, if, you, if you're in medicine and you're doing radiology like I was, normally you'd stay and do that your whole life. And then you would, um, you know, you're not planning. On, I mean, when I built the AT, I wasn't planning on going into astronomy. I thought I'd do MRI for the rest of my life. And most scientists... They stay in their garden. It takes enormous forces to push you out of your garden or for you to leave your garden. And so what happens is very few people have the time to, to spend, okay, now I'm going to spend 10 years or 20 years going through what these people are saying in the hopes that maybe there's something not right. I mean, people don't do that, right? You, you, I stumbled on it and, and saw this this. It just doesn't make any sense. And I'm, and I'm. Can you imagine like a structural correction to the peer review system or to this departmental siloing? Is there something in the future that could actually address this kind of issue from becoming a problem so much? I, I don't know. The, the, the problem is, is that fields have become so specialized, as you already mentioned, right? So fields are so specialized and, and people. There's enormous amounts of money involved here. I mean, when you're talking cosmology, you're not talking a million dollars here. You're talking billions of dollars spent on this stuff, right? And, and the astronomers have to justify this, right? And so they justify it with their, their clips on TV, five news, you know, at five o'clock. And then here's this thing in astronomy. And you see it all the time on online news, you know, some great finding in astronomy every few weeks. They were always discovering some unusual great things. And that's because they're trying to get the public interested in astronomy, right? But if we actually look at it, is this really where humanity should spend so much wealth? I mean, mm. I really have questions about it because we have some real problems, as I mentioned before. And, uh, you know, I think the astronomy needs a complete overhaul. I mean, I used to talk about this with John, uh, John Wilkins in physics. I, I, I used to tell him, you know, it just needs a complete overhaul. I mean, not only is it problems with the data that's collected, 
which is fine. Normally you, you think, well, okay, at least the data we collected should be good. But the problem is in all their papers, they've, they're manipulate how they manipulated the data and, and, and played with it before they finally presented it to you. I mean, the whole Which thing, depends on their biases going in. It really just seems like this lack of self-awareness in a way. Yeah, so, so the problem is it's an it's a, a enormous problem for astronomy. And I think we've we've really hit the dark ages of modern science in, in, in some respects relative to astronomy. And people have to just say enough. You know, you guys have to follow the rules. I mean, if as I was mentioning earlier about non-intensive temperatures and, uh, you know, telling us that the sun has an imaginary surface and that, and that the heat capacities of stars are negatives, all these things that they, they force us to swallow because that's the way they keep their, their, you know, putting, keeping their puzzle together. I mean, it, just too much. So eventually we do have to speak up and that's what I've tried to do. And hopefully there'll be some people that will start listening and say, you know what, there, there could be problems in astronomy. Maybe we need to start paying attention here. And the best thing that could happen is that, uh, you know, NSF, which funds most of astronomy, would say, you guys don't get to just fund yourselves anymore. You know, the study mm. sections need to have people sitting on the study sections that are outside your field that are going to be critical of your field and yeah. that, that won't just say, yeah, well, let's hand you another billion dollars or tell NASA, let's build another uh, satellite that's going to cost humanity many billions of dollars to chase something that is of dubious foundation. So I, I love the idea of biologists reviewing astrophysics grants. Well, I don't know what kind <laughs> of people will do it. That's the problem, right? But maybe some people that are... And the astrophysicists can review the biology grants. That way yeah. no one gets any money. But, but we need to figure out some way, you know, science has become so specialized and we need to, we need to broaden that. I mean, it's been a mistake that, I mean, for the advancement of science, of course, when people are developing vaccines and stuff, it's great that science has become very, very specialized and we can move things forward rapidly. That's fine. But when, you, when you're looking at fundamental questions, you know, people need to take the time to, to really consider the problem and, and have a perspective outside of themselves. And, uh, this, might, this might occur on the level of countries jockeying for power, right? It, so the way that I see it is that science is kind of an extension of political standing, basically. Yeah, it's, you know, inter it's, it, it's interesting, you know, I was, I was recently with Steve, with Steve Crothers, we were interviewed for a Russian documentary. I think I, I, I had mentioned to you guys in private, you know, so it, what's interesting about that is that it's a documentary on the birth of the universe. Of course, they advance a theory alternative to the Big Bang. But it's interesting that the Russians, and this is sponsored by the Ministry of Culture, that the, Russian would, the Russians would fund such a movie, right? That you, you have a governmental agency that's funding a movie that's questioning the Big Bang. And, and the actor, the guy who is the, the lead person in this film, just completed a film, a, a, a real movie in Russia, and, and the, the movie is questioning cosmology and the Big Bang and is it all real? And then after that, that was followed by a documentary. So it seems like the Russians, and I had mentioned to you before that I had been invited by the Astro Space Center to go to, to Moscow to discuss the microwave background. And it seems that the Russians are more careful. I mean, they, they, they're open to the fact that we might have a problem here and, and maybe we should think about it. And maybe they're trying to get their society ready for the idea that maybe the Big Bang is about to leave us. Mm. And uh, maybe that's wow. why the documentaries are taking place. But, but relative to the, to the microwave background, uh, you know, there, there's other problems with the anisotropy maps. Like we talked about the Planck satellite and I have a little video on Sky Scholar on the 4K loads of the Planck satellite. And those 4K loads are supposed to act as black bodies at 4 Kelvin. And they do not. They act as resonators. So that means that the whole satellite LFI system has a problem. 
And, and this should have been spotted before the thing was even launched. So it, it shows you that there's, now I think what's happening is the engineers realize that there's a problem, but you know, there maybe there's cross communication that's not too good. I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's also, it's also a cover your ass situation because if you start coming out and being like, well, we did get lots of money and we spent it, but we spent it wrong or we screwed up. That looks really bad. It's really yeah. hard to justify giving more money away to somebody who's done that. And worse, people might lose faith in their institutions in general. Right, and, and people are scared that people will lose faith in science. But I, I don't agree. I think you got to circle the wagons, otherwise, yeah, that, what will happen? That, that, well, the world's scientists, okay. you know, we're going to lose faith in science because people like Robotai are complaining that there's a problem, <laughs> and this is going to make us lose faith in science. Absolutely not. I think that what this shows is that. There are scientists out there that care, and people should be trying to pay attention to them. Like, for instance, we, you had Steve Crothers on a previous podcast, and people tried to dismiss him because he's written papers against general relativity. But the fact is, is that, you know, he's, he's been invited, like, to go to national, international meetings in Russia repeatedly. He, we went once, but he was repeatedly invited, and, of course, he didn't want to travel to Russia repeatedly to go to these relativity meetings. And so there's some people that are paying attention, you know, that, and there's, there's, there's always going to be somebody that's going to look at your stuff. And uh, if you publish something, others have a right to look at it. And, uh, and then that's true in all aspects of life, right? It happens with politicians. People go back and review things that they had done and then they find that it wasn't so kosher. And it, it also happens in science, right? So we, we have the example of that book, Plastic Fantastic, right? It, it's a, it's the, the story of a, a scientist who made up data and he published it in the, it was physics data, it was condensed matter physics. And, and he, he published it in the best journals, you know, Nature and Science. And, and, and he became so famous and he was, it was all falsified. And, but it got into all the great journals, you know, people don't talk about that. Who is this? That. Uh, if you look up the book, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, Plastic Fantastic is the name of the book, I can tell you that. And if you look, read that story about the fraud that took place in condensed matter physics, and, and, and that's the fraud that was caught. I mean, this guy was over the edge. I mean, he was, he was, he was really, I mean, falsifying everything and trying to say that he's come up with new materials and stuff in condensed matter physics. So eventually he got caught. And, but, but not until he had published many papers in the best journals. And uh, so, wow. so the thing is... It, is was, that, uh, it was Jan Hendrik Schoen, I think? Yes, that's and right. And he, he faked the discovery of a new superconductor while yes. working at Bell Laboratories. It looks yeah, like. while working at Bell Labs. And it is, it's one of the classic cases of, of scientists falsifying work. Uh, to get ahead. So, you know, people, you know, scientists, people give them credit for, you know, well, we have to be honest. And, we, we, you know, in the end, scientists are humans and they're just like everybody else. And, you know, and hopefully... And not even a, that, like they don't have to be malicious, but it just goes to show that evidence isn't the whole story. There's always this interpretive aspect of science where you're trying to explain what's happening. And maybe right, there's explain multiple it. explanations. Right. And you're you have to, to really consider it, yeah. everything. And you have a self-interest, right? So people have a self-interest in what they're doing. And, and not everybody is malicious. But there are people that are, but, but they're rare, hopefully. And, and in science, we, we hope that they're rare. And, but, you know, that's why you need review. I mean, you need not just peer review. You need somebody who decides, I'm going to look at your stuff, <laughs> and, and that has the ability to look at it, mm. which is not an easy thing to do. I mean, mm -hmm. to so get where I want to make sure now, we have time to, I, I spend to a lot talk of time. What? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, to get at where I'm at now, to be able to review the stuff in cosmology and astrophysics, I spent years. I mean, first of all, I had the years of formation of my PhD, and then my postdoc, and then years doing MRI and understanding imaging, and and all the physics that went into it, I mean, people make a mistake of thinking that MRI and NMR doesn't have a lot of physics in it. Well, they're mistaken. They, they can talk to anybody and they, they'll learn that 
there's an awful lot of physics in NMR and, and, and MRI. So I was well positioned to go after this, even though I didn't realize, you know, that it would be such a long course. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, my training had been such that I can follow it and, and then highlight the problems. And the problem is, one of the problems is that the, the astronomers themselves aren't quick to highlight the problems. And, and there are some, I won't, uh, Harold Zirin, in, uh, he was a, he was, he had a nickname, Mr. Corona. He was a solar physicist. And if you read Zirin's books, you'll see that he often brings up things that don't make sense, that, that are puzzles in solar physics and mm. that there's something not right here. And, and, and he would write it in his textbook. So he was very brutally honest in the state of the field. And there are some, and, and there's a cosmologist who unfortunately, I can't think of his name right now, and he just passed away. He was Russian. And he, uh, and I, I plan on doing an episode on Sky Scholar on him in, a, in the next few months. So even though I forget his name right now. Uh, Those Russian names can be a doozy. Yeah, so... Anyhow, I will do a film on him because he, he actually did quite a bit of work comparing Planck and WMAP data and showing that in the end, these data sets don't agree. And, uh, and he's a cosmologist. He's trained a cosmologist, as a cosmologist, but unfortunately, he died very young. I think he wasn't even 50 years old. And mm. So there are some people that, that will go after things. You know, science is, uh, we have an open world and uh, we, the libraries are open to anyone. And you never know who's going to find something by reading papers. And some people are serious about their reading, like I am and Steve Crothers is. I mean, Steve is a very, very careful scientist. Even though people attack him constantly, he's extremely careful. And I think some people are realizing it. And that's why he was invited to go talk in Russia and why he was featured on this Russian film. So anyhow, now these, so the thing about cosmology is they also try to, the data that they don't like, they try to ignore. <laughs> so, so, for instance, this happened when I was telling you about water, you know, that, that the COBE satellite, in, in that paper, COBE of radiological analysis that I wrote, I, I talked about all the times, I mean, every time these guys were doing a measurement near the Earth, they always had trouble with water. And, and the COBE team, the COBE satellite team, the NASA team, they... they uh, mimicked water as a 300 Kelvin source. They, they, they treated it as a 300 Kelvin source. That's the oceans. But the oceans are not a 300 Kelvin source in the microwave, right? So in the microwave, uh, the oceans have very unusual behavior. Mm. So if, you, if the satellite, if you, if you take a satellite that's a microwave satellite, it's a detector, and it's looking straight down on the ocean, and that's normal. We call that it's looking down at the normal, okay? And, and if you look straight down, the oceans look, depending on the frequency, they could look like they're at 150 Kelvin, for instance, okay? And then uh, in one polarization, I think it's in the horizontal polarization, but don't keep me to it. It's either horizontal or... or so as you tilt point. the satellite. As you tilt the satellite, so you now you're moving away from the normal and you're going to tilt the satellite and you're going to scan towards the horizon. So instead of looking straight down at the ocean... Now the satellite starts looking towards the horizon. And as it does this, in one of the polarizations, the temperature is going to rise. It's going to go to about 300 Kelvin. Hmm. At a certain angle, it'll hit about 300 Kelvin. And then once it gets there, as it moves towards the horizon, the temperature rapidly drops towards zero. So hmm. that's in one of the polarizations. Now in the other polarization... It'll start at 100 Kelvin, let's say, or 150, and it'll slowly, gradually move towards zero as you're moving, as you move towards the horizon. So, the so you can get is, any temperature you want out of the ocean. No, well, so, so what are they seeing? As long as it's so, between 300 So the zero. question is, what are they seeing? So when I looked at it, I said, well, what's happening here? Now, if you look at the oceans, there's another thing about these satellites is when the NOAA is looking... Uh, at satellite data for the oceans, they don't just measure the temperature in the microwave and say and call it good. That's the temperature. They have buoys all over the ocean 
And these buoys are sampling the water. <laughs> they tell you this is the temperature at, right next to me here. I, I have a thermometer in the water and that's the real temperature, okay? Mm -hmm. And now the satellite is coming near the buoy and it gets a temperature, right? So the NOAA is able to correct the, the temperature it gets from the satellite with the real temperature located at the buoy, right? Mm. So, so why is there this discrepancy if microwave is so clean, right? There shouldn't be a discrepancy. And even if you have, if you have winds on the ocean, if, 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 you, if you increase the wind speed uh, on the ocean, that'll change the temperature. So it, why does the temperature change? The water temperature isn't really changing, but now we've got ripples and now we've got a different caused by wind speed on our temperature. So this gets back to the fact that water is not a simple solvent, right? It's a very complicated solvent and it has two types of bonds in it, right? So within the water molecule itself, you have a hydrogen, an oxygen, and another hydrogen. And those two hydrogen atoms, they're linked to the oxygen by what's called a hydroxyl bond in chemistry. That's called a hydroxyl bond. But then between water molecules in a liquid or in a solid, you have a weaker bond where the hydrogen atom from one water molecule is interacting with the oxygen atom from an other molecule, okay? And that's called a hydrogen bond. It's very weak. Now, I did a, a paper years ago. It's published in Progress in Physics, and it's about water and the microwave background. And what I did in that paper is there's something known as the water dimer. So it's just two water molecules together that make a dimer. And you get this in vapor state. So, and what happens is that you have this hydrogen bond. So this, this molecule is, is translinear. What does that mean? That means that between, so you have the two oxygen molecules from the two water atoms, and then there's a hydrogen between them. And the hydrogen for one water molecule is part of the, hydroxyl bond, and then it makes a weak bond to the other mo water molecule with a hydrogen bond. So the, the hydrogen between the two oxygens is actually oscillating between the two oxygens, right? And that's a very unique uh, little scenario. And I was able to show that the ratios of the energies, approximately the ratios of the energies that are contained in each bond is a, is directly related is equal to the ratios of the force constants. So when we, when we look at a molecule in, in spectroscopy, you know, we often think about it as a harmonic oscillator. There's a, it's oscillating, the two atoms are oscillating. And then we, we can actually think about this as a, a mass on a spring, you know, and you learn this in freshman physics, you know, that force- So like how stiff the lattice is basically. Force equals KX, right? So you have a, a force constant, K and then the displacement X, so, so the spring is, is moving, right? Well, in the water dimer, what's interesting is that the hydrogen is, is shared between the two atoms, between the two molecules, right? Because it's got the weak hydrogen bond to the second mo water molecule. And so what happens is that the X there, if it's X for one, it's minus X for the other, and if you look at the energies, it's the square of that x, but we, we don't have to worry about it, the mathematics a little bit, but it comes out that if you look at the water dimer, you see that the ratios of the energies are the ratios of the force constants. Now that's very dangerous for the cosmologist because the ratios of the energies, the ratios of the force constants is a factor of 80 to 240, if I remember. And so that means that if you have a water molecule with a hydrogen bond, you're, you're thinking about the hydroxyl bond, and it should be vibrating to give you something like 300 Kelvin. Let's, let's assume that that one's going to give you 300 Kelvin, right? Now the other one, it's going to have a force constant and correspondingly an energy that's 80 to 240 times lower, somewhere in that range. Well. If it's 100 times lower, it's going to be, if the first one was at 300 Kelvin, if it's 100 times lower, the other one's going to be where? At 3 Kelvin. Mm. So the hydrogen bond is a very, very dangerous thing for the cosmologist because it has the, the ability to mimic a 3 Kelvin source. That's mm. what I'm saying. You could have water could be at 300 Kelvin, right? 
But because it's a liquid, and because you have a hydrogen bond in it, now you can think of, instead of looking at the Earth, and you say, okay, now the, the Earth has an ocean. It has oceans, okay? And that gives us a source of microwaves. I don't look at it that way. I look at it like the Earth has an ocean, and has oceans, and one of the components that's emitting from these oceans is the hydroxyl bond from, hyd from water. And that's giving us the behavior I had previously described with the 100 Kelvin when you look straight down and then going up to 298 and then as you go to the, to the horizon, you go to zero, you go to zero, near zero Kelvin. And then the other one moves slowly from 100 Kelvin. The other polarization moves from 100 Kelvin slowly down to zero. Mm -hmm. So what you have there is you have the hydroxyl bond in water is acting like that's one of the sources. Mm -hmm. But because the hydrogen bond is so much weaker, it's mm -hmm. essentially uncoupled from the first one. So you can consider these two sources as completely different from one another. Mm -hmm. I can think of water as I have the hydroxyl bond, which gives us one behavior in the microwave, and then I have the other one, the hydrogen bond. Now the hydrogen mm -hmm. bond is very interesting because I told you that if you look at the lattice of water, in ice one, which is the most typical form that you'd see water, the hydrogen bond is arranged such that it's hexagonal planar in lattice form. So hexagonal planar, that's like graphite, okay? So, so that's the danger for the cosmologist, that the, the water itself has the ability to behave as a black body and it's going to emit in the microwave somewhere around 3 Kelvin, as I showed you with the dimer. So, mm -hmm. so this is a real danger for them. And what I've said before, people have said to me, well, water is not a black body, Pierre. But actually, they're mistaken. If you take, if you take the hydroxyl bond, okay, you get this behavior and it's clearly not black body. But how about the hydrogen bond? Well, if you take water and you shock compress it, it becomes mm. optically black, okay? So if you do this in a laboratory, you take water, you shock compress it, like you, you put a piston and you're going to accelerate the piston against the water and it, you're going to raise the pressures enormously. And there's some videos of this with nuclear tests, if I recall correctly. Right, there's, and I've showed on my website and in my lectures of nuclear tests where you can see when they were testing nuclear weapons at Bikini Atoll, there are films of this, and what happens is that when the bomb detonates, the water turns optically black. They used to call it the slick. So what happens, I mean, the water is perfectly blue there, right? But what happens is that there's a shock wave that's coming through the water from the bomb, and when that shock wave, what is it doing? It's compressing the lattice that's already there. So you have this lattice. Of, because it doesn't have time to rearrange here. This is a shock wave is moving through it very rapidly. So the lattice that you have is just getting compressed. And what happens is that that lattice now moves from emitting in the microwave to emitting in the optical or absorbing in the optical. So it becomes optically black, right? And then the shock wave carries through and then the water then becomes blue again like it should be in Bikini Atoll, right? So, so this shock compression, what is it telling us? It tells us that water has a structure that if it becomes optically black on compression, it shows that this structure was already there before the detonation. It's just that you compress it now. Well, before you compress it, in, be, instead of emitting in the optical, it's emitting in the microwave. Well, that's where we are, with the monopole of the microwave background. So, so that's, that's what I'm saying. This do you battle, imagine that these are sort of, it's like a transient lattice? Like, how do, you, uh, how do you imagine that the liquid behavior of water is maintained? So while what happens is that water has a fleeting lattice, right? So you have a hydrogen atom, and sometimes it's forming a hydrogen bond with another water molecule, and sometimes it'll change, and now the water will rearrange and you can actually get a, a rearrangement within water. That's why it's called a fleeting lattice. But if you look at it... Uh, just, fleeting lattice, I missed that. It's sorry. called a fleeting lattice, right? But the lattice is there, the structure is there, right? It's just a, it's a time scale. Now, when physicists look at lattice structures in water, 
or in liquids, what do they do, right? They, they bombard the stuff with x-rays or neutrons, and then they try to get a crystal, so they try to get a structure. Well, you can't take a weak lattice, like the hydrogen lattice of water, and bombard it with neutrons and think that you're gonna understand <laughs> what is the order that's taking place in water. And Jerry Pollock, which you also interviewed about two months ago, he talks about the fourth phase of water that, that on surfaces, you have this planar arrangement of the water molecules that they're hexagonal on the surface. So, and that's not just, that's not just the hydrogen lattice now, that's the molecule itself of water. It, it becomes planar and he calls that easy water. Mm -hmm. And he's done some great work and it's been federally funded. But so water is very complicated and the astronomers, I mean, if Penzias and Wilson knew this in 1965, now they weren't trained as biochemists. If they had been, they would have thought about the hydrogen bond and, and the danger of the hydrogen bond, right? So I'm a, I'm a biochemist and I became a chemist. I mean, but I was trained as a biochemist first. So the hydrogen bond is, is critical in biology. We think about it all the time. And so, you know, the astronomers don't think about it. They think that the COBE satellite thinks it could monitor the COBE team in their papers say, well, we, the earth is a 300 Kelvin source. You know, the oceans are approximately a 300 Kelvin source. It's just nonsense. In the microwave, that's not at all how it behaves. So I think there's a lot uh, that they're not being careful about relative to water and its ability to, to generate the microwave background. And this goes back to the fact, as I said in the COBE radiological analysis paper, that all the times that water was causing them problems in their measurements, you know, they would launch balloons up with, with radiometers in them, and then they'd have cameras to look inside the horn of the radiometer uh, of their detector to look inside the receiver horn to see if they had condensation of water, you know? Why? If you didn't care about water, why is the condensation important? Because water, when it's condensing, is going to give you microwave emission, so that's going to pollute your experiment, right? So, so and then there's stories, you know, that cosmologists, they're, they're looking at antennas and then whenever they have a, a water body near them, they have zero, very little problems getting what they want, right? And then it's just, and then, and then we go back to an, an even more important experiment and that's Haruni's antenna. Now, that's a sad story for science, actually. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to go through Haruni's antenna and what happened. And so Haruni's antenna is an antenna, it's a large antenna, I think it's 54 meters across if I remember, but I could be mistaken. It's enormous. And mm. it was built in Armenia and it was built by, by Professor Haruni. Now who was Paris Haruni? He was actually one of the key radio engineers of the Soviet Union, right? He apparently, I think he worked on the, the radar system for MiG fighters and all kinds of things like this. He was their top, probably in the Soviet Union, probably the top radio engineer. And he wanted to build a radio antenna. And he managed to convince the Central Committee of the Soviet Union to put this thing in Armenia instead of Ukraine or Russia where big projects normally went. This antenna went in Armenia. And what's important about Haruni's antenna is unlike most radio antennas, its detector is completely protected from the environment. So he hmm. built a hemispheric dish. It's a, instead of a parabolic antenna, which is common what they use in, in radio astronomy, they use parabolic dishes. Like this with Penzias and Wilson? Pardon? No, Penzias and Wilson had a, had a horn antenna. It wasn't, uh, it, it was, it, that was an old antenna. It was a simple antenna. And it, it looked like a square horn, basically. Uh, but, but it was more, well, it wasn't really square. It, was, it, it almost looked like a scoop, like a, a sugar scoop or something you'd use to scoop. Mm. And, mm. and uh, anyhow... So th th that was a different design, and it was open to diffraction, by the way, into the antenna. Penzias and Wilson's antenna was like that. The Kobe mm. satellite was like that. Now, Wilkinson, mm. I, I digress a little bit, 
Well, Wilkinson, who was a member of the Kobe team, he was concerned that Kobe had actually not eliminated the diffracted signal from the Earth. And he was minimized. And the WMAP satellite ended up being named after him. It used to be called MAP, and then they added the W for Wilkinson. So he was concerned that maybe there was diffracted signal that had come from the Earth into the Kobe satellite. And that should not be minimized at all. So what happened with the Haruni antenna is it's a hemispheric antenna. So you think about it, the bottom of it is like half a sphere. And above it, it has sides that extend above this half sphere. And then the detector is, is deep within this dish. So there's a big dish and it's a hemisphere and the detector is like a bell sitting deep inside the dish. So what happens is you cannot get diffracted signal coming from the edge of the antenna. It can never enter the detector. It always will be kicked out. Hmm. So, he, so Haruni called it an edgeless antenna. And what was important about Haruni's antenna, not only the, the phenomenal construction of, of that antenna, which there are films about it and I've done little videos on it, and it's actually featured in this Russian film, which I can give you the link to, which you can put under your podcast if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but let's do that. Because I speak in the Russian film, I talk a little bit about the Haruni antenna. But what was amazing about Haruni's discovery is that when he, when he tried to measure the microwave background from the sky using his antenna, he got zero Kelvin. He, he didn't get a signal from the sky. Now everybody is saying, well, there's a signal from the sky. But mm. I'm saying, no, the signal is coming from the Earth. It's the Earth's oceans that are giving you your signal. But the what's call is coming from and inside this the house. Like, sorry? I said the call is coming from inside the house. Yeah. So her, and this was the first antenna that wasn't capable of measuring the Earth at the same time. Right. Because it was an edgeless antenna and it didn't permit diffraction into the detector, unlike mm. all the other measurements. Okay. So, so he got zero Kelvin for the sky. So... If the signal came from an ocean, for instance, he's on top of a mountain. Haruni's antenna is on, it's on top of Mount Aragats in, in uh, Armenia. And if the signal came from the oceans, it would come, hit the edge of the detector of the, of the hemispheric dish, and then just be, it, it would just travel inside the dish, reflect off the two balls, and out it goes. It would never go and hit the detector. Mm. So Haruni understood this was an edgeless detector so nothing from the forest or vegetation or signal coming from the earth could enter this detector it, it had to come from the sky and he got zero kelvin from the sky so when he when he got this he sent the result to 10 laboratories that were doing microwave background work and none of them in a period of 10 years answered him when he claimed that there's no signal coming from the sky. So here the cosmologists are ignoring a major world antenna because it conflicts with what they want. So it says, I'm not getting anything from the sky. And it confirms my idea that the signal actually is coming from the earth because Haruni's antenna wasn't able to get the signal from the earth, okay? So, so what happened? He sends the, the result to 10 laboratories. They never answer him. Then he decides to publish the paper. He writes a small paper and he sends it to a, a, a Greek journal, a small Greek journal, and they publish it. So then years pass and Steve Crothers and I come along and we, I, a Russian contacts me and tells me about Haruni's antenna. And so I, I got fascinated about Haruni's antenna, read about it, and then try to track down the papers and it turns out that the paper that Professor Haruni had published and I got a hold of Professor Haruni's niece who's now in charge of trying to to save this antenna for humanity so I, I, I got a hold of Professor Haruni's niece and she sent me some papers and then I tried to find them in the journal and they weren't there the paper was not in the journal. So Steve contacted the editor and then the paper just, it just as if it had never been published. Of course, we had, Professor Haruni's niece had a copy of the journal with her uncle's paper in the hard copy of the journal. It had been published. And eventually, after some uh, discussion, the journal put the paper back in. But mm. unfortunately, they put it in the wrong issue, but they put it back in the journal. Now, mm, okay. 
Did they say why it disappeared in the first yeah, place? Yeah, isn't that interesting that, that Haruni's paper disappeared? Now, then the Wikipedia keeps a list of all the radio telescopes in the world, and Haruni's antenna was listed there. And what happened was somebody went in Wikipedia and tried to say that Haruni's antenna was never functional, okay? Mm. When in fact, it had, it had made measurements in astronomy outside the microwave background and the microwave background measurement. It had been functional. And, and so people tried to say this antenna never worked. Now, this antenna worked and Haruni stood by it and he wrote a paper that the Big Bang doesn't exist because of his measurement. And so what I'm saying is the signal just needs to be reassigned to water. And I do not believe, so remember that the Kobe signal is the most perfect black body curve ever measured by humanity. And the signal to noise is tremendous on that curve. They, they have so much signal that you, they have to blow up the error bars by 400 fold just so that you can see the error bar on the plot, okay? Well, there's a rule in radio communication, right? If you have powerful signals, you're near the source. And so, you know, this is true if you're listening to FM radio and uh, you're in Columbus or where I live or wherever you are, you're listening to your favorite FM station, you, you drive away, eventually you'll lose the signal, right? Or the AM signal, you'll lose it. Now we could bounce up the atmosphere and so on, but outside of the, such bounces, you'll lose the signal. So strong signals indicate that you're proximal to the source. So mm. when the astronomers got such a strong signal from Kobe and they're sitting on the Earth, they should have thought, well, gosh, this signal is awfully strong. Maybe it's coming from the Earth, right? And I think that I will be proven right. The signal does come from the oceans of the Earth. It's the hydrogen bond that messed them up. And it's a sad thing for astronomy. I mean, you know, and I think that it's a, it's a question of time until all of this collapses. So the, the notion that, that cosmology, and I've said it before, the notion that cosmology is a science, to, to be a science, you have to have data. And, and unfortunately, they're going to lose all their data, right? This, the signal is going to get reassigned to the Earth, and, and people will recognize it. You, you will never know the formation and temperature of the whole universe. I mean, it's, it's just too much. And people need to stop spending time in such pursuits. We have a lot of intelligent people, and they should direct their, their intelligence to things that are profitable to humanity. And, and so... I'm kind of tough on it, but uh, there's a reason why I am. And I think uh, mankind is going to go undergo great transformations in the next 30 years as, as all of this in astronomy gets washed out. And now I did want to mention one thing about astronomy. Mm -hmm. People try to say, well, well, nobody's paying attention to them. And I, I don't know if I had mentioned to you guys before this book, Honoring Galileo, for the 400th anniversary of, uh, of astronomy. Had I discussed this? I, d I don't think I did. But nope. anyhow, this is, this is a book that was a few years ago. I, 2009 was the 400th anniversary of the birth of astronomy. And so this is a book on questions in modern cosmology. And uh, the two editors were from the University of Padua, where Galileo was. He was in that town. And so this book was to honor Galileo. And in this book, I actually talk about the microwave background at length. So there's a bunch of luminaries here, Nobel Prize winners and so on, people that are well-known in cosmology. And I was the only cosmologist invited to make a contribution to this text. And so Only non-cosmologist. Non the the non-astronomer. I wasn't a yeah. non-cosmologist, non-astronomer invited to make a contribution. And... And they, they argued that this was a sense of fairness, and that was noble of them. And, you know, of course, I was in a radiology department, and I disagreed with them strongly as the interpretation of the microwave background. And in the text, I also talk about Kirchhoff's Law. And after my section, the editors wrote a small paragraph where, where they say, well, Kirchhoff's Law is well established, and we disagree on this. Well, you know, actually... They need to revise their text because Kirchhoff's Law is not well established. And, you know, there's no, they think that there's thousands of papers that, that demonstrate that Kirchhoff's Law is valid. And it's quite the opposite, right? 
Thousands of papers demonstrate that it's not valid, right? We have microwave technology, we have resonators, we have MRI. All these things cannot be dismissed. Kirchhoff's law is just not correct. So, so I do have a section in here, and it, w it was a privilege to be invited. And one of the what, you ask yourself, well, why why was he ever invited? So I think this goes back to the New York Times ad and and the seventy thousand emails that went out, right? That, that people came to know that I was objecting and I was letting people know that I objected, right? So, so the methods ended up working, right? The cosmologists are well aware of me. They might not like me, but they know I'm there. Well, so. I hope that this matter gets ironed out, but even more so, I hope that some lessons are learned from the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, there's some... There's some People have to take a, a real hard look at what's going on in science. I mean, I had a friend, I don't know if I had mentioned it, I talk about this often, but John Robit, he's deceased now, and he was one of the top starch chemists in the world. And uh, there's an enzyme that, that makes starch. And Did I ever discuss this? Mm -mm. So there's an enzyme called starch synthase, and uh, it was always thought that starch synthase needed a primer. In other words, in order to make a, a, a starch is a bunch of glucose molecules that are alpha 1,4 linked. So you have one glucose next to another one, next to another one, next to another one, that makes a starch molecule. And the, the enzyme that does that is called starch synthase. And it's a very important enzyme, of course, in biochemistry. And people had thought, well, starch synthase needs a primer to make starch. You have to have at least 10 glucose molecules and add that to the to the starch synthase that you have in your test tube and now it'll start making starch okay so for years that was that was the way it worked in biochemistry everybody thought that starch synthase needed a primer but actually it didn't it was because they were isolating the starch synthase using a buffer called tris buffer it's a very important buffer in biology but tris buffer was binding to the enzyme and it was preventing the active site from properly starting the synthesis of starch, synth of starch. So by changing the buffer and getting rid of it, so what happened is when you had tris buffer in there, you had to add a primer to get the tris off the starch so it could start making, uh, off the starch synthase so it could start making, so it could start making starch. So, so this is an example, you know, so if you change buffers now, you don't need a primer, you just, you just have your starch synthase in the test tube, add some glucose, it'll make starch. Now, John, who's deceased now, he was a close friend of mine, and he was, one, he was a, a very eminent uh, carbohydrate chemist. I mean, he had worked with Dexter French at Iowa State, and Dexter French was Mr. Carbohydrate Chemistry, I think, worldwide. And, and, and John tried to correct this mechanism of starch synthase. And even though he was a recognized expert in the field, it took him years <laughs> to get people to understand that it's a buffer problem and there's no primer needed for starch synthase. Mm -hmm. so, it's ex so the lesson of that is that it's extremely hard to change science, even when you're an insider, right? So think but that's by it. design. That's by design, right? Because the system has to be robust enough to serve as a foundation for something right. that comes next. Right. So you have this dilemma, right? You have to have a robust system that you could build on. And then now, but when you do that and you make it too robust, now you can't correct your errors. And that prevents further progress, right? Where and there's probably less these? money invested in starch synthase than there is in the Large Hadron Collider, too. Yeah, so that there makes probably things easier. is. Much so if you took money. him years with no money invested to convince people that there was no need for a primer, then you can probably scale that linearly per dollar spent to figure out how long it's going to take with cosmology. Right. It's going to take a long time. And, and for cosmologists, I mean, what's the way out? I mean, I had a, uh, a person that wanted to work with me. He was a he was a cosmologist. Uh, he was trained at Cambridge, and he wanted to work with me. And I said no. <laughs> and I, and the reason is, is that he was too young, and I, I didn't want to hurt his career. And uh, he ended up getting out of cosmology completely and, mm. and, and going into condensed matter physics. So that's, that's what's going to happen. They're going to have to change fields, but they have to they have to realize that okay, we have all this training and knowledge of mathematics and 
and science, now we have to apply it somewhere else. So it's a, it was a very, very painful transition. And, you know, I, I don't see how, I don't know how this will all play out. And Planck said that science advances, you know, when, basically when people die, you know, science slowly will advance. And one funeral at a time. It's an unfortunate thing. What? I think he said one funeral at a time. He actually didn't say it that way. That, that is a, that's attributed to Planck. But his, that, and it's a very common way of saying it, you know, science advances one funeral at a time and people attribute it to Max Planck, but actually his is more eloquent. He wrote a paragraph mm. in, his, in a philosophical book. People don't know this, but Planck actually, in, he wasn't just a physicist. He really cared about the philosophy of science and he wrote several great works, very interesting works on the philosophy of science. And it's, I think it's in one of those books where, where he talks about it and it's not said the same way. And I forget. Mm. I mean, it's a whole paragraph and I, I, people can look for it. And, but but it the is spirit a, of the matter <laughs> remains. The Close spirit enough. remains that, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated thing how science will end up moving forward, you know. And for our purposes, I mean, you have to have somebody that says, well, there's a problem. And he must not care about what people think. I mean, I really don't care. I mean, I, I, I say what I have to say and it'll, it'll be worked out over time, you know. And if you want a paradigm shift, that's what you have to do. Now, you have to follow was the there, rules of Was there a moment where you were just like, uh, maybe I should just study something else instead? No. You know, were you, were you at when all I, afraid of I the I ramifications? Discovered- when I discovered there was a problem with the microwave background, I was gone. I mean, I left MR. Now, there were many forces that caused me to leave MRI. They weren't just scientific forces and uh, why I left and stuff. And, and uh, you know, I just keep those to myself. But when I went into to this, I knew that this problem is, is of great importance for humanity. So I'm going to work on it. Now, interestingly, you don't get credit in science for correcting something. You get credit in science for something new. But when you correct somebody, there's a, there's a famous case of, uh, this is actually in my own field in NMR, there was a professor at Harvard that thought that you could diagnose cancer by looking at the relaxation times from blood and so on. And, and he wrote papers and, and somebody else took years to, to show that this wasn't right. <laughs> You know, so you don't get credit just because you show something is wrong. <laughs> mm. you, you do have to make credit in sciences for moving it forward, not, not correcting, you know. So and that's one of the beautiful things actually about your own work is that you do propose an alternative. And there's a lot of critics who don't propose alternatives. So I right. think that's a, that's, that sets a really cool standard for future scientists facing paradigm shifts. Well, for me, I'm, I'm looking for the lattice, right? I'm, I'm looking for why do you have a thermal spectrum? And, and once I require the lattice, then I place it on the sun. I say it's condensed matter. And then I also require the lattice for the microwave background. The, the hydrogen bond in water gives me the proper lattice that I want. That's going to end up being the answer. Mm. So, yeah, so I do try to give, you know, there's a correction and here's the, here's the solution. It's coming from this. And I think people that take the time to think about, you know, it, scientists can be reactionary. You know, they get upset and Pierre's methods and whatever, and they get upset and they don't know me. And why does he do it that way? And because we're in the middle of a paradigm shift, so I don't have an, uh, another means of doing it, right? I'm trying mm-hmm. to... to make a dramatic change in astronomy, right? It's not an incremental change. I, it, it's a complete reformulation of astrophysics. So that, that leaves me less options than most people have. I mean, if I was still doing MRI, I would publish my papers in MRI journals and get them peer reviewed and then answer the reviewers and, and so on and do things, you know, as is done in science. But when you want a paradigm shift, it's different than that. And you have to bring the idea forward first and let people think about it. And don't worry about the credit or how it was done. Just bring the idea out. That's what humanity needs. And then people Mm. can decide for or against. Absolutely. And 
from a personal standpoint, I'm kind of glad they haven't given you your Nobel Prize yet because you probably wouldn't be talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'll tell you something about the Nobel Prize. It's a very interesting thing that people don't realize, but you have to have friends to win the Nobel Prize, right? People have to nominate you, so you don't worry about those things too much, you know? There's a lot of talented scientists that never got it, and uh, like Raymond Damadian, which we talked about before, that probably he deserved one he, he should have won it and and there are others that have done very beautiful work and and never got it and then there's some that have gotten it and you know maybe it's questionable that they should have ever gotten a Nobel Prize right it's still a human thing and at the end of the day you know when when your life comes to an end you're not counting the medals on your chest right these things really they don't really matter. I mean, they matter to some people really care about these things, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's it's less important than we give it credit for. I mean, and I, I think there's a lot of lessons there for humanity. You know, we're, we're all kind of in this boat together, and, you know, there are more important things than medals on your chest. You know, there's, if, if people are starving around the world, and, you know, what does it give you to have a medal? I mean... You know, I, I always say, you know, kids are eating in garbage dumps in Mexico. I mean, this is a reality. And uh, and people are starving and dying of sepsis. But there's all kinds of problems that we have. Look at Haiti right now. I mean, Haiti is a newsflash in the United States. I mean, we'll talk about it and, you know, they, we'll hear about it on the news. And they still haven't recovered from the previous earthquakes and hurricanes. Now they got another earthquake, another hurricane. And it's it's at our doorstep and it's utter poverty, right? And we're we're having people going off in space and spaceships and spending billions of dollars and people are starving at our doors. I mean, so so there humanity's got some I mean, who cares about metals, right? I mean we won't be answering. Well, I think this. everybody wants to know that people appreciate them and appreciate their work. And that's what it really boils well, down to. Well, my wife appreciates me, so I'm very <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm that's happy important. With Hey? Not everybody can say that. Yeah, my, I, I have a good marriage. My wife appreciates me, so I'm, I'm a happy, I'm a happy husband. <laughs> All right. Well, Doctor Doctor Robitai, thank you for spending so much time with us and walking through basically from the very start to the present moment of how you came to investigate these questions and the paradigm shift that you see as necessary in science. Honestly. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for the opportunity. You know, I, I know it's a lot of uh, hours that we spent talking and it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity that you're giving me because, you know, normally when I do my channels, uh, my channel Sky Scholar, you know, I stick to a topic and it's very short and presented and it's over and, and there's no casual conversation like, like we had here on the podcast. So you gave me a... a a wonderful opportunity to share views that normally you'd never see on my own channel. Oh, thank well, the you pleasure so much. is all ours. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate you. Thank all you right. so much. God thank bless you. you. Thanks a lot. Take Bye -bye. care. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.